Uh, you can turn to chapter 24 in the story. If you were here today and you say, I don't know all about the story, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6 and Mark chapter 4. And most of the scripture passages that I'll be reading throughout today's sermon is going to come primarily, but not exclusively, from Matthew chapter 6 and Mark chapter 4. Their entire world consisted of just one small island. They measured personal wealth by the number and the quality of seashells that they owned. They had never heard once the roar of an engine. They had never experienced the striking of a match. They had never experienced a cold day. No one had ever explained to them the laws of gravity. They believed the entire world was only what they saw and what they experienced. That was until 1930. Not all that long ago. Dad, are you in here? <laughs> he was born in 1925. So on his fifth birthday, these folks on that island discovered something new. Two white men arrived on the island of New Guinea. Both of them named Michael. One of them Michael Levy and the other one Michael Dwyer. They were two Australians that were prospecting for gold and they began to explore this island. The natives were not initially very hospitable as these two men introduced them to a world beyond their own little island experience. The islanders had never seen skin so white or bodies so clothed. Seeing soap bubbles for the first time as the prospectors bathed in the river, the natives thought the bubbles were skin disease. <laughs> the natives thought that the lanterns the men carried around at night were containers with pieces of the moon inside of them. When Michael Dwyer took out his dentures, Dad, are you here again? He can do that for you. The natives ran screaming into the jungle. And I'm wondering if we could be accused of a similar response. I'm wondering if maybe we also suffer from tiny islanditis. Do we think that the whole of reality is what we personally see and what we individually experience? How do we respond when a foreigner visits and points out that we're just one tiny dot on a map of reality? And what those two Michaels did on the island of New Guinea is exactly what Jesus Christ did for this world when he arrived on the scene as a baby and then significantly when he launched his ministry into this world. He expressed to the world that we are a tiny dot in all of creation, but we are an important dot. Amen. We're a dot that is loved by God himself. Jesus was an invader, a foreigner, an alien, an outsider. He spoke a language that many were not used to, and he lived by principles that were never known before, and which often you and I still yet today find difficult to embrace. Jesus spoke of a kingdom. In the story, we are going to discover Jesus declaring, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near and here. Repent! and believe the good news. In fact, if you have your story Bibles, we can turn to 335. Let's kind of get a highlight or a flavor of this particular chapter. Last paragraph on page 335, second to the last sentence. He told them the secret of the kingdom has been given to you. Flip a page, 336. Second to the last paragraph, first sentence. He, being Christ, also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. Last paragraph, same page, first sentence. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? 
a couple of pages to your right, to page 340. And you will find the last sentence in that, uh, on that page. This is the classic Sermon on the Mount. And this opening section where he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The last sentence in that blessed area goes like this. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The very next page, page 341, in that classic prayer that's an example of how you and I can learn to have dialogue with our Heavenly Father. And in that Lord's Prayer, the opening line, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth, in earth, as it is in heaven. 342, the very next page, uh, second to the last paragraph, third sentence from the concluding sentence. This comes out of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all of these things will be given unto you. It's obvious to us as we read this chapter that the ministry of Jesus Christ was going to be built on a message that the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe this good news. Chapter 24, today's chapter, has dozens of sermons in it that ought to be preached, that have been preached. Chapter 24 is filled with parables. And just the parables... Uh, in, in, in these couple of books. Uh, sermons can be preached on every single one of them. Volumes of books have been written about the parables of Jesus Christ. The miracles of Jesus in chapter 24 that come out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Walking on the water. Feeding of the multitudes. The healing of the leprous man. The, uh, the demonic activity that took place in the presence of Jesus. All of these are sermons that could and should and have been preached. Then you can look at the encounters of great significance that Jesus had with folks throughout the Gospels. The classic prayer. Every one of those are standalone sermons. And yet today, we have to do it all in one sermon. <laughs> so we're going to focus on the kingdom. Because you see, the teachings and the miracles and the signs and the prayers all point to one thing. The kingdom of God. You see, through the teaching of Jesus, we will hear and discover the wisdom of God through the simplicity of parables, stories, and the Sermon on the Mount. Through the miracles of Jesus, the miracles like the calming of the storms and the walking on the water and the feeding of the multitudes, we discover Jesus and His creative power over His own creation. And through the miracles of Jesus, like the healing of the withered hand, curing an issue of blood, the removing of leprosy and the restoration of a life back to community, we discover and learn of Christ's love for those who were created and bear His image. And then through His message of repent, be forgiven of sin, we discover the joy of Christ in raising us from the death of our trespasses and sins, we discover how much Christ loves to bring life to the lifeless. So today, we are going to focus on the subject of the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be a part of the kingdom of God? This was the theme that is laced throughout all of his teaching and ministry in chapter 24 of the story and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the New Testament. In the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the kingdom takes center stage above everything else. It is mentioned over 60 times in just those three Gospels. The kingdom of God. You and I have a tough time thinking about kingdoms. We live in a democracy. So we tend to think about life based upon what our experience here is. A monarchy, a kingdom, hard for us to get a handle on, to appreciate, or align our thinking with. A monarchy is not something that is medieval. 
a monarchy is biblical. Monarchy started in the times of the Scripture. In fact, the nation of Israel was a monarchy. First with God as their king, and then, remember, in our journey through the story of the Old Testament, they wanted a king like other nations. Instead of an eternal king, they wanted a temporary king. Instead of an all-wise king, they wanted a king limited in wisdom. Instead of a king that was everywhere, they wanted a king that was limited to their vision. So monarchies have been around since almost the beginning of time. It's not medieval, it is biblical. A king is the one who created the universe. A king is the one who commanded a flood. A king is the one who led the Israelites to freedom from captivity. A king is one who awed the foreign kings, even like Nebuchadnezzar, who made them pause and think about what they were doing. The Old Testament prophets predicted a coming kingdom led by a new king in Zechariah 9, 9. Listen to what that Old Testament prophet wrote. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, you daughters of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and with salvation. He is gentle and he is riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. Is that the way you would expect the king to arrive in his kingdom? On a young, small donkey? We think of kings on white stallions with big armies behind them. But you see, this king in this kingdom is different than what the world thinks. Jesus enters as king into his kingdom with an attitude of humility rather than grandeur. Amen. He came as a servant, though king he is. He's come to seek and to save and to serve those who are lost. Amen. Humility. Think about the way that Jesus entered life. God as a man through the birth canal of a woman. Jesus is king. Humbly riding into the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. And think about how the scripture describes that this king wants to enter your life and mine. The Bible says this king, let me pause right there for a moment. If you were king, and you had a kingdom, would you have the right to go anywhere and do anything with anything that was in your kingdom? Most kings did. Everything belongs to them. Everything that their subjects have, they have at the, at the, at the bequest of the king. But notice this king. He says, I stand at your door and knock. I have the right to knock it down. But just as I came into this world humbly, I will come into your life humbly. I will knock. And I will wait for you to allow me to come in. Why? Because this is a king who is interested in a relationship with you and me. He doesn't come to dominate. He comes to redeem. He doesn't come to destroy us. He comes to, re he comes to restore, restore us. This is about relationship. God coming in the garden in the cool of the evening and hanging out with Adam and Eve. It is about God coming into your heart and spending the rest of your life and His eternity together in relationship. Though keen He is, He comes humbly. Jesus Christ is that new, lowly king. He is a Nazarene carpenter who will change the world. The kingdom of God. I remember as a junior in Bible college, there was nothing more dangerous than a Bible college student. Okay? They've had just enough college, student, uh, college education to drive them mad. They think they have all the answers to every challenge that is out there. Why? Because we've been reading and studying. We've been debating and arguing in class. And let me tell you, one of the biggest arguments in Bible college is where is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? Is it here? Is it there? Has it come? Is it on its way? And no matter what your eschatological, eschatological perspective is, no matter what your view of end times is, no matter how you perceive the second coming of Jesus to come is, let me just summarize it this way. The vast majority of folks missed him the first time. 
Now, I promise you this, no one will miss his second coming. Amen. It'll be very, very public. But here's the deal. One of the reasons they missed it the first time is because they didn't understand the kind of king that he was. I don't want to be one of those the second time around that when he comes back, I am going to hold on to what I thought he was supposed to come back was going to look like. I don't want to hold on to the tree of my belief and say, no, Jesus, it wasn't supposed to be this way. If I have to stay here on this earth for a thousand years before I get to go up and be part of his kingdom, that's okay with me. If he takes us instantly to heaven, wipes out this world, and we have a new heaven and a new earth, that's okay with me. I don't quite frankly care which way it is, just as long as I'm a part of his kingdom when he comes. Amen. That's the key part. Amen. But I remember as a Bible college student, boy, I, I didn't always believe that. I, I held tenaciously to a perspective. And I remember my junior year of Bible college, I went to a glass convention in Southern California. The glass convention had nothing to do with windows. It was the Greater Los Angeles Area Sunday School Convention, okay, called Glass. And it was one of the best and hottest things out, okay, in the 1970s that was creative and innovative about how churches could do Sunday School in a better way. And I had just been appointed uh, as the new Christian Education Director in the church that Dad was pastoring. All right? I thought that was a great place to keep a junior in Bible college quiet, okay? Uh, and, and so they sent me to this glass convention, and I remember the first event I went to was a luncheon, the kickoff for the conference, and a guy by the name of Stuart Briscoe was the speaker. I had never heard of Stuart Briscoe before. Come to find out, he was this famous author and speaker. He came from England. He had planted a church in Minneapolis that had grown to about 4,000, and that was before there were many churches that ran 1,000. I had never really heard of the Torchbearer Ministry. I'd heard of a guy by the name of Major Ian Thomas, which many of you have heard me quote on numerous occasions. Some of you had the opportunity to meet him personally. But I heard Stuart Briscoe for the very first time at this luncheon. And he wowed me with his sermon that day, his presentation at that luncheon as he kicked off this convention because he answered very simply a difficult question. It was so powerful for me that I changed my itinerary for the rest of the conference and whatever he was speaking at, I went to. It didn't make any difference what the subject was. And here's what I learned that day from Stuart Briscoe. Mm -hmm. Things that we have spent three years arguing and debating in Bible college about. Where is the kingdom of God? When has it arrived or when will it arrive? What's it going to look like? And Stuart Briscoe on that day summarized God's kingdom in a very simple and powerful way for me. He said, God's kingdom is wherever and with whomever God is king. Amen. His kingdom is wherever God is king. Are you his kingdom? 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 See, the requirement is not how old you are or how young you are. The requirement is not how much knowledge you have or how, what the lack of knowledge may be in your life. It's not about the economic status of your life. It's not about the ethnicity of your background. It is not about the prospects of your future, how long you have to live or how much you have to offer with the life that you have. It is not about whether you're healthy or whether you're sick. If you were part of God's kingdom, you were part of God's kingdom because you have given a humble king permission to be king in your life. Amen. The kingdom is here. And Jesus said, repent, be forgiven of your sins, and be part of my kingdom. God was up to bring in a kingdom to this world. Jesus taught about that kingdom. We looked at several examples already in the story. Jesus' kingdom weapons are not armies with swords. If you turn to Mark chapter 4, pages 336 and 337 in the story, you're going to find he uses three parables to talk about his kingdom. He first of all talks about a farmer who's planted a crop. And as he scatters the seed, 
Some of the seed lands where it's supposed to in the good soil that he has prepared. Some of it lands on the side of the field and it's on the road, but it really isn't in the field. And some of them will land uh, where there's some shallow dirt in the midst of the rocks and others just plain old rock. Some of those seeds won't do anything. They will die right where they are. Some of those will sprout up very quickly and then when the sun troubles come, it will scorch them and they'll wither and die very quickly. And those where there's good soil, there's care and provision, they will flourish and a crop will be produced. Another one of the parables is about a farmer who plants a seed and it talks about he plants the seed and then he goes to bed and sleeps. And while the farmer's sleeping, Mighty work is taking place. Life, growth, development take place. The transformation occurs in the field. And then he talks about the seed itself. The third parable, the, the mustard seed, the tiniest seed in that culture in that day. You could barely see it with the eyeball, but you could. And th th that's, that seed was an example in that parable of what the size of our faith must be like. It's not about having huge faith about having pure faith, a willingness to trust God. So Jesus' kingdom weapons are not armies with swords, but Jesus' armies are farmers with seed. Have you enlisted? In God's kingdom work, if you are part of His kingdom, you are a farmer. Now that ought to be comfortable for us here in the San Joaquin Valley. Okay? I mean, this is the hotbed of farming in all the world. But God's kingdom is about farmers scattering seed. And here's the beauty of all these parables. Notice, it is not up to the farmer how well the crop is produced. It is up to the farmer to plant the seed. That is why when he's sleeping or when he's planting, the progress of the crop is not on the farmer. It is upon God who gives both the seed and the soil. You and I, as part of His army, we are called to scatter the precious seeds of truth of God's story in and everywhere. You know what, folks? Do you realize in that story... You understand what the, if we're going to value, if we're going to put the value of success on something according to that story, you will fail three out of every four times you share the story. Four examples of seed being scattered and only one of them produced life. The other three ended up in death. But you see, no one would ever discover if we don't scatter the seed. The kingdom means that God, who is king, is here within I reach. God is here. Do you remember that? God is here. Reminds me of the two boys. I think I've told them before. The two boys, they were 8 and 10. They were mischievous brothers. Okay? You probably don't have any kids like that. <laughs> I did. But they had two boys, two years apart, and they were both very mischievous. This mom was raising these two boys all on her own, and she just could not get them to get their life squared up. And so she asked the pastor if he would mind helping her maybe impress upon her sons what good and appropriate behavior is. And so the mom and the pastor talked about it, and the pastor told the mom, you know, what I want to impress upon your boys and help them to understand is that no matter where they are, God is there. God sees and knows everything that's going on in their world. So when you bring them in, I'm going to talk to them about God is here. And so the mother thought it was best if the pastor talked to each one of them separately. And so she sent in her 10-year-old. The 10-year-old sat down on the couch in the pastor's study. And the pastor sat down and got right in front of the 10-year-old. And he put his hands on his knees. And he looked at the boy eyeball to eyeball. And he said, son, do you know where God is? And the boy sat silent, quietly. The preacher asked the boy a second time. Thought maybe he didn't hear him clearly. He said, son, do you know where God is? The boy did not move a muscle. The preacher a third time, slightly irritated. Not a very patient pastor. <laughs> and he got very loud this time. He said, son, did you hear me? Do you know where God is? He jumped up off the couch, ran out of the office, grabbed his brother by the arm, said, come on, buddy, let's get out of here. They've lost God, and they're trying to blame it on us. <laughs> Folks, God is not missing. He 
is not lost. He's within our reach. But do we live as if he's not here? William Barclay, a prolific, deep thinker of a previous generation, wrote a whole series of books on the entire New Testament. He said, the kingdom of God works in men's hearts. The kingdom of God is to produce not new things, but new people. It is not a revolution in material things that we are to look for, but it is a revolution in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. God wants to change us. He wants to transform us. And the change is not going to be for our harm. The change is always for our good and for our prosperity. Three principles of the kingdom of God that come out of this chapter are first of all, one of them is described in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through 46, when he compares the kingdom of God as a great treasure. He says the kingdom of God has great value. It is like a, a gold hidden in your field or a pearl that you have discovered, a huge expensive pearl and you sacrifice all in order to obtain it. He said there is no amount of investment that you can make into the kingdom of God that won't return far beyond the price that you paid. You and I don't necessarily connect with pearls a lot in our culture. I mean, ladies like pearls, but not to the same extent that they used to. Culture pearls in a different culture had far more value than what you and I understand today. And here's the reason why. Pearl hunting involved immense danger back in the beginning, first century time. The fine quality pearls that were obtained from the oyster. The oyster thrives at a depth of 40 feet below the surface of the water. This is not a treasure that you often stumble across just along the beach. First century pearl hunting equipment consisted of a rope and a rock. A pearl diver would tie the rope around his waist and then he would tie the other end around a large rock. He would then drop the rock overboard and he would dive in after the rock. If he didn't dive in, then it pulled him. <coughs> and it's the weight of that rock that would hold him at the bottom of the ocean, 40, 45 feet below the surface. And it's there that he would grovel in the mud looking for the pearl oysters. While there, he risked dangers from sharks and eels and other creatures that would scour the mud below. An average of only one oyster in a thousand would contain a pearl. All the while, the pearl hunter had to hold his breath as long as he could, gather as many as he could, in the hopes that he wouldn't drown or lose consciousness before he would cut the rope just above the rock with his knife and then be released to surface to the top. Very costly to acquire a pearl of great price. You can see why they were so precious in those days. The Jewish Talmud said that pearls are beyond price. The Egyptians actually worshipped the pearl and the Romans copied that practice. When women wanted to show their world, they put wealth and they put pearls in their hair. When a Roman emperor wanted to show how rich he was, he would dissolve pearls in vinegar and then pour it in his wine and drink his wine. <coughs> in much the same way, a millionaire might light his cigar using a hundred dollar bill. Actually, if that's all I have, I might use it. <laughs> The kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God is not only a great treasure and a priceless pearl, but the kingdom of God operates with energies we do not understand or control. We can explain how a seed falls to the ground, dies, cracks open, life comes, and you and I enjoy fresh squash and okra and tomatoes. We can explain the process. But let's be honest, we don't really understand the process, do we? How from that little bitty seed, we get a whole table full of food? Hard for us to imagine. The kingdom of God operates with energies far beyond 
our ability to understand or even control. And sometimes we try to control the energies of God's creation. How many of us have, have with a landscape or often a professional, laid out our yard and we've had them come in and plant the beautiful flowers and lay out where our sidewalks are going to go and our boundaries on our flower bed and, and, and then we want a, a tree right here for shade and so we plant this five gallon bucket tree right here in the middle and, and we think we've got this whole thing figured out. Seven, eight, nine, ten years later that, that sidewalk is not level anymore. It's got a big hump in it. And, that border around the flower bed is now all busted up. Why? Because that little five-gallon tree has now not only grown up, but it has grown down and it has grown out. And those roots just work like a like a a, a massive jack, just pushing up everything in its way. That's the work of the Creator and the activities of His own creation in ways we do not understand. The third principle of the kingdom of God. And turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. The kingdom of God, listen carefully, is a worry-free, anxiety-free realm. So make this connection here real quick. Where is the kingdom of God? Yes. Wherever God is king. Is God king in you? Then you're in His kingdom. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 that the kingdom of God is a worry-free, anxious-free realm. Is that an adequate description of your life? Listen to what Jesus Himself says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, who is this doing the talking? This is the king. The king speaking. I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you eat or drink. How many of you are thinking about lunch right now? <laughs> or about your body or what you will wear? How many of you were very picky about what you dressed in this morning when you came to church? You even asked for somebody's opinion. Do I look good? And every one of you men said, absolutely, darling. <laughs> Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store in barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worry can add a single hour to your life? And verse 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So if I don't worry, what do I do? Verse 33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all of these things, the food and the fashion and the fun, all of those things will be added if first we seek the kingdom of God. I would suggest to you today that there are many who sit in our churches who have postgraduate degrees in anxiety. They know how to worry about worrying. As I've often said at memorial services, our lives have been inwardly fashioned for faith, not for fear. Fear is not the native land. Faith is. We are so made that worry and anxiety are like pouring sand into the machinery of our life. But faith is an oil. It lubricates our life. We live better by faith and confidence than we do by fear, doubt, and worry. If fear is present, if fear is present, there is an absence of faith. For where faith is present, we will discover an absence of fear. If he is keen in his kingdom, if Christ is in the Christian, this is a faith-grounded, spirit-empowered, Christ-dependent, heart-surrendered, fruit-bearing, trial-overcoming, daily-sustaining life. Christ in us, keen in his kingdom, is another way of describing the life that we abide in Jesus. How we pray continuously, how we enjoy the life of faith. Abiding in Christ is the daily experience of the presence of Christ and allowing Him to live His life in us and through us. 
It is Jesus Christ who lives the Christian life. It is the kingdom who empowers the kingdom life. So that our efforts alone cannot produce righteousness. Our efforts alone cannot bear fruit. Our efforts alone can never transform the life of any other person. Abiding in Christ is holding steady in the presence of Christ. Trusting His promises by faith, irrespective of the awesome challenges, the huge trials, the difficult tribulations that our lives will face. Remaining in faith and looking to Christ to be our sufficiency in the midst of our own inadequacy keeps us in His constant conscious presence. And only by abiding can our ministry efforts have an outcome that will last throughout eternity. Abiding in Christ, the king on the throne of our lives, is an ongoing conversational relationship with Jesus Christ, which is maintained through moment-by-moment -moment dependence on the Holy Spirit and a constant looking to the grace of God for His power in the midst of our weaknesses. If I was going to be an ambassador of the United States to a foreign country, when I live in that foreign country, I live in that foreign country with all of the rights and the privileges and the authority of the United States of America. When I live in that other country, I speak on behalf of the president of this country. And if I, as an ambassador, am going to speak on behalf of our president, I must be in regular communication with the authorities of this nation. If I am going to speak with that authority, I must be speaking with the authority. And the same thing is true in this life. If I am going to be a kingdom member, then I have to be in conversation with the king to face every challenge of life. The qualities of the king being the king in this kingdom is going to be demonstrated by gratitude in our life's disappointments. You ever been disappointed with life? Did you show up today disappointed? If you didn't, you could be disappointed with the sermon, so you'll leave this <laughs> But in our life's disappointments, can you be grateful? The quality of Christ being king in His kingdom in your life will be demonstrated by sweetness, experiencing sweetness in God's presence. When you and God are in conversation, you can sense the sweetness of His abiding presence in you. It will also be expressed by joy in the daily mundane tasks of life. You often heard me tell the story of the young man who worked with me at the Bible house. And walking down a hallway one day before the store opened, we were there getting everything ready, just four or five of us employees in there, making sure we're ready for the day. We hired a guy who was going to a, a biblical seminary here in town at the time. He wanted to work at the Bible house badly, but we didn't have any position open in the book and Bible department. In fact, we did not have any position open out on the floor working with customers. The only position we had open was a janitorial position. Packing, mopping, cleaning the toilets, taking care of chores like that for us. He said, I'll take it. And I remember walking down the hallway one morning and out of the men's bathroom, I hear singing. I hear singing. And I stopped and I opened the door. And here's Michael down on his knees in front of the men's journal, one of the worst places to clean. We always miss. <laughs> and he is scrubbing and he is cleaning away and he is singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And I looked at him and I said, Michael, why are you singing like this? He said, Oh, Tim, I'm cleaning this toilet today as if Jesus were going to use it. <laughs> and I walked down that humble with a heart broke, broken. Because though I was the manager of the store, I did not have the same attitude as the janitor of the toilets. And I learned a very valuable lesson that we can experience joy in the mundane tasks of everyday life. A vacuuming the floor, that's why you do it so often. <laughs> Fixing the car, picking up dog poop, going to the job, just thinking of things that we do. Can we find joy in the mundane things of life? Major Thomas illustrated it this way. To get light from an oil lamp, filling it first with oil is entirely reasonable. 
That makes sense? I mean, some of you all don't know what an oil lamp is, all right? But, but most of you do. Let, let me use the next analogy. To get a car to provide you with transportation, filling the tank with gas is completely logical. Is it not? Amen. Okay. In the same way, divine logic affirms that obtaining righteousness from a man or a woman happens only when that person is filled with God. When the king is king of his kingdom. Oil in the lamp, gas in the car, Christ in the Christian, king in his kingdom, it takes God to be a man. And that is why it takes Christ to be a Christian. Because Christ puts God back into man, and that's the only way we can be functional again. To be in Christ, we have redemption. But for Christ to now be in us, that is sanctification. Growing up in Jesus Christ. To be in Christ, that makes us fit for heaven. That was the thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Why? Why could he be in paradise that particular day? Because he was in Christ and he was now fit for heaven. But for Christ to be in us, living on earth, makes us fit for earth. To be in Christ, that changes our eternal destination. But for Christ to be in us, that changes our daily destiny. The one makes heaven our home in the future. The other makes this world Christ's home. In this world, we are His workshop. The King in His kingdom makes all the difference. Last of all, Jesus' miracles demonstrate His royal authority and power. Jesus speaks to the winds and the waves and they obey Him. Jesus blesses bread and fish and they multiply. Jesus speaks to or is touched by the sick and they are healed. Jesus calls the dead and they are raised to life. Jesus speaks to demons and they fear Him and they obey. To display the legitimacy of the kingdom of God, Jesus demonstrated His authority in all of these ways. When those demons were confronted with Jesus Christ, what did they do? They didn't negotiate. They didn't resist. They didn't disagree. They simply said, can you give us a new location? <laughs> they were willing to go to, from a fine man to swine. <laughs> they didn't mind living in pigs just as long as they didn't have to deal with Jesus. Is the king in your kingdom that powerful? Is the king in your kingdom powerful enough to enable you to live a life that is worried and anxious and free? Or have we settled for a king in our kingdom much like the Queen of England? By the way, side note, just found that out this week. You wrote, you know, the Queen just had a birthday last month, big party, big festivities one. Did you realize that King Charles, I mean Prince Charles, is now the longest he has waited the longest to become king of anybody in history. Uh, king Henry VII had waited longer up until, I think, just a few weeks ago. And now Prince Charles, he just can't wait for mama to die. And <laughs> I don't believe that, but he's waited the longest. His mama's lived so long. He's waited a long, long time. But you know what? The Queen of England, the King of England, they no longer have the power they once had. They're kind of a symbol, like our flag like our national anthem. Nominally, they're head over all, but in every crisis, someone else makes the decisions. On formal occasions, they appear in their royal attire to deliver the same colorless speech put in their mouth by the real rulers of the country. The whole thing may be no more than good-natured make-believe, but it's rooted in antiquity. It's a lot of fun, and nobody wants to give it up. Is that the way the king of your kingdom is treated? He really doesn't have authority. Remember, King Jesus is a humble king. He's not a haughty king. He's a king about relationship rather than about dominance. What kind of king sits on the throne of your life? Let me ask some pointed questions. Is Jesus Christ king of your marriage? Husbands, do you preach to your wives to be submissive to you as unto the Lord? Or do you talk to the Lord about treating your wives in the same way that He treated the church? Do you try to be keen by dominance in your own family, or do you choose to be the head of the household because of the humility of Christ in you? Wives, how do you treat your husbands? Is Jesus Christ keen of your marriage as a wife? 
Is it key to your marriage? Is it key to your money? Decisions that you make of what you do with your resources, do you pray about them? Do you seek wisdom? Do you seek counsel? You see, there's a throne in all of our lives. Every one of us has a throne. It's called the will. It is from the position of that throne that decisions are made. Who's sitting on the throne? Emotion? <coughs> Any of you ever bought things emotionally? <coughs> Any of you ever made other decisions emotionally? Then there's another person who can sit on the throne, and that's our intellect. We can do lots of research, and we can use our own ingenuity and wisdom and make decisions with the best that we have. And is your best been less than adequate sometimes for making decisions? Will, intellect, self, or Christ? Christ who can demand the waves and the winds to cease and they listen. Who can demand that the demons head to the pigs and they obey. Who would you rather have sit on the throne of your life? King of your marriage, king of your money. How about king of your ministry? How about as a parent? Who's the king in your parenting skills and your relationship with your kids? Humble or haughty? You need to apologize to your kids about something? You need to hold your kids accountable about something? How about your own education and employment? Who's keen to, you know, God's not interested in that. Well, wait a minute. Key, the kingdom's concerned about everything. Amen. Is the key to your hobbies? Is Jesus Christ keen? Somebody has said either He is Lord of all or He is not Lord at all. It's sad, but it's true. Jesus introduces us to a God who is keen, but He's humble and He wants a relationship with us. Listen to this. The prayer of Jesus as an example for all of us to remember. You know what? Say the first line with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Stop. Thy kingdom come. Think about that line. How did the prayer start? Our Father. Couldn't it be started that with our King? Do you understand how, how dynamic this prayer really is in its simplicity? We're praying for the kingdom of God to come, and yet Jesus gives us an example that when we pray to the king, we don't pray to him in the dominant position of power as king. We pray to him in the loving relationship of a heavenly father. Our Father who art in heaven. Why? God as King wants to relate to us as Father and Child. This is all about relationship with Him. Do you have that kind of relationship with Him? Do you love Jesus Christ in such a way that you're saying, Lord, of my money, of my marriage, of my possessions, of my relationships, of my ministry, I am going to let you be king. Because you are better at it than I am. Let's pray. If there's the arena of your life you have discovered today that Jesus is not king, would you surrender that position to him before you leave here this morning? Dear Father, you know each of our hearts. You know most of us in this room are control freaks of one kind or another. We like to control our passions. We like to control our hobbies. We like to control our families. We like to control our jobs. We don't want to be owing to anyone. And yet, Father, you tell us that you've already paid our debt for everything. Father, I hope we can come to the discovery of what it means to let you be king in your kingdom. And that means we let you sit in the position of authority of our life, knowing that as our Father, you will love us rather than as a king choose to dominate us. Father, thank you for how your spirit helps us understand this message today. In Christ we surrender all. Amen.